welcome to everyone that's dialing in for this particular call. It's a great pleasure, obviously, for me to have John Wenzel on and to have Lawrence. Lawrence is going to do a wee intro in a minute. Uh, hopefully you can hear me over the background music. I thought it'd be fun to play something to get us started on this as you're all dialing in. And I think this one's appropriate because we're clearly not living in a uh, factory nine to five environment anymore. Or maybe we are, and this is just a slight delay and we're going to mean revert. We're going to explore that on the call. What I'm just going to ask though, before I hand over to Lawrence, is please do get involved. Ask your questions, have your chat, uh, do that in the Q&A. Um, and if you really want to make sure that I actually see some of the questions, please do put it in the uh, Q&A functionality, not just the chat. It's a lot easier for me to go and pick up on. So, with that, Lawrence, can I hand over to you to kick things off? Right. Uh, thanks, Colin and John, and welcome to all. Just by way of introduction, my name is Lawrence Diamond. I'm responsible for uh, the deal strategy and implementation thereof in the EMEA region. Firstly, thank you for taking the time out um, in what will be the first event in a series of events that is going to be hosted by Deal, focusing on the future of work. In today's session, we're asking a question, is the traditional staffing model dead? And I think it's a very apt question to be asking and exploring at the moment, obviously, given the fundamental shifts that the global workforce is currently experiencing. In terms of a qualified person to assist us to unpack this, Dr. John Wenzel, uh, there's no question in my mind that John's insights and his passion into this topic can assist us with understanding the current status quo and also understanding some of the future challenges that we have. John is the current Chief Executive Officer of AdCorp Holdings. AdCorp, I'm sure most of us know, but for those that don't, is the leading workforce management solutions provider in South Africa and Australia. And like I say, I have had the opportunity to spend some time with John and uh, there's no doubt his passion and his enthusiasm for the industry, for the world of work, is something which re resonates with all of us. I've also had the privilege of working with Sir Colin Isles, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I call him Sir because it's a private joke. Colin's ideas, his insights, and his continual ability to challenge the norm and drive new paradigms in business is insightful, to say the least. So without further ado, I really hope you guys and everyone enjoys this session. Like I'm saying, it's the first in a session that Dill will be hosting. We'll chat a little bit later about the next session, which I think is also going to be super exciting for all of us. I'm handing back to Colin for you to take it away. Thanks, Cole. Lawrence, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. All right, John, um, we need to kick off. But before we get into the, the uh, topic, I think we just need to, um, to get you introduced more uh, formally there. Um, what I see is is absolutely well. It's surprising. I mean, you're you're sitting there, lots of experience, CEO of a of a company which is doing incredibly well, and at some point you've obviously gone through a mind shift there and thought, I know, let's go across into the resourcing services sector in the middle of a pandemic with COVID nineteen and the recession that goes through that and the transformatory workspace. You couldn't have chosen a harder time to go and swap out and move into AdCorp. Why why did you do that? <laughs> Thank you, Colin, and, and good afternoon. Uh, probably two things. One, which we may pick up during the course of the chat, is the purpose that AdCorp um, has. And it's on, I think it's on the logo behind me, connecting potential. So the purpose of this business resonated with me. So that's the, that's the one thing. The second thing is we are probably at a tipping point in respect of the workforce and the staffing model and the future of work. And you don't often uh, get the opportunity to be part of not just leading a company or transforming a company, but helping to shape an entire industry. And, and that excites me. So for me, in the midst of, of a pandemic, as you say, you don't often get these opportunities to not only give effect to something that you're passionate about, which is about leaving a legacy and a legacy of adding value and making a difference in societal problems, but also to be part of shaping an industry. So that's why I joined AdCorp and um, you know, I'm really looking forward to it. Now, when, when we were um, chatting about this particular session and wondering who'd be great to, to bring on, I mean, um, I think you were one of the first names that we drew out of the hat, not just because you're working at AdCorp, well, working out with the CEO of AdCorp, and you're actually seeing from the front line exactly what's happening, but obviously your experience beforehand. Can you just give us a quick rundown of the resume? Because I think you've been in, in most industries and many different geographies already. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short. I, I initially trained as a nuclear physicist, of all things, and... Uh, yeah, from I, nuclear I physics moving. 
<laughs> you know, then I moved into business and I've had the opportunity to work for a number of FMCG companies, banking companies, um, logistics companies, retail companies, and so forth. And the last decade, I've been in a workplace solutions business, which operate across uh, Africa and into the Middle East and looked after all of their operations outside of South Africa, 21 countries, and grew that business across across Africa. So in the last 15, 20 years, it's been very much in the B2B space, very much in the workplace and workforce space. And it's a, it's a passion that I have. So, you know, that's that's sort of where, where I come from. And, you know, be, beyond leading um, AdCorp, I, I still remain active as an academic with, uh, with Gibbs and the University of Pretoria and previously with the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore. And, and bringing together academia and business uh, to me, is, is something that's a huge amount of fun. So, you know, that's a little bit of who I am and, and where I came from. So let's let's start in the past then, before we go into the, this idea of the future of work. I mean, we're, we're titling this as the traditional model dead. Um, let's go back before COVID, you know, 218, 217. What, how would you describe the traditional model from all of your interactions in the businesses that you were at before and, and your experiences? It's a, it's a good question, but it's also an interesting question from a perspective of who's asking it. So we, we speak about the traditional staffing model being, being dead. And I think if you look back to where sort of organized work comes from, it's a model that arose in the early part of the last century and really grew and, and arose from a manufacturing perspective. So if you are a baby boomer, you will be familiar with an organizational structure that is hierarchical, where work takes place in a geographical location and where work is defined in respect of hours. So you start at a particular time and you finish at a particular time. But if you were to ask young people joining the workforce now, generation Y or the millennials, generation Z, the work, the, the work or, or the staffing model that they're familiar with looks completely different because they used to a very different model. So I think the work or the staffing model, the workforce model, has been evolving for an extended period of time. If you look back to uh, what was the model predominantly in, in the time when the baby boomers made up the bulk of the workforce, where it was predominantly a permanent workforce, a geographical location to carry out that work and a fixed time schedule, I think that model is dead. If you look at youngsters, Generation Y, Generation Z, they will say, well, it's not that's changing, but it, but it really hasn't died. So I think it's been changing for an extended period of time, but the model that was premised on Henry Ford's manufacturing plant, I think that probably has, has passed significantly. But you know, another way to look at it is also to say, well, it's not the same for all industries. You find that whilst we, we talk about work for a moment, we, we talk extensively about how things have changed, there are large swathes of industry where it, it really hasn't. And that's because of the nature of the industry. So manufacturing still depends on a geographical location and a fixed time where employees um, work. So I think one must also be very careful because it's probably changed in sectors that are white collar far, far more than it has changed in sectors that are traditionally blue collar. So that, that's really interesting that. I mean, let's, um, and we'll probably have to, to be a little bit focused on this and um, for want of a, a sector to look at, I'm, I'm probably going to go more for that white collar, more for that services, you know, space, more for some of the knowledge based workers, because, you know, that's in all honesty, it's the background that I come from with the banking, you know, background. Now, if I think back, you'll have to tell me which generation I am. I'm, I always get confused on this. But I'm born in the 70s and really started, you know, my working career in the, in the sort of late 90s and, and have progressed through. My, my sense was I didn't see a lot of change during that time yes we had technology that was enabling us but it was still the commute it was still office bound it was still hierarchical it was still very much based on if you put the hours in that's going to give you a significant advantage just because of your presence if you want to get promoted it doesn't matter what um, systems are in place to go and um, to rate what you've done over the previous session 360 feedbacks peer reviews you know top-down assessments it's essentially your network I always felt that was really driving and you were, you were retrofitting some of the uh, templates back in to go and support decisions that managers had already made. And so 
incredibly good if you're successful at the politics and the networking and you can live that hard life and you can actually proceed and do very well. Incredibly depressing, you can end up in some in challenging, quite caustic environments and you really end up walking out feeling like you are just literally an employee to an employer. You're a servant for the bigger cause. And when you come to the end of your tenure, I'm, I'm putting a very negative picture here. When you come to the end of the, it, you might get a gold watch, but effectively that's the end of it. There was really no love lost in terms of that departure point. Am I being totally unfair? Is this something that you just think in financial services or is that still prevalent across a lot of knowledge industries? The, the experience that you sketch probably I can resonate with as well as an ex-banker. You know, I spent, uh, I spent a decade as a, as a banker and had the opportunity to run a small savings bank as well. If you go back in time, I think what you will find is around about 2007, 2009, we had the financial crisis. And I think that was a significant tipping point in the way that workers looked at companies. You had the go-go 80s where it was very much about making as much money as you could. And then you, you sort of, got into the early 2000s. In 2007, 2009, you had this financial crisis, which was the first major crisis um, of the, the, um, the new century. And I think what it did was, especially for people who were entering the workforce or who were new in their jobs, there was a significant backlash against what they saw as the primacy of maximizing financial return and everything associated with that as the sole measure of the difference and the value that companies add. And I think since that you've seen a significant change in how both investors and employees look at companies. Adcorp presented its results a couple of days ago. One of the things which uh, investors asked was, well, tell us about your purpose. Tell us about how you are making a difference. And I do think more so than prior to 2007, investors and employees are looking at companies and expecting companies to make a contribution beyond just pure financial return. They are now asking, and we, we see investor activism uh, most recently in the last two weeks. Uh, you saw Shell, you saw Exxon losing significant uh, investor votes around how mm -hmm. they deal with things like ESG. So currently, I think purpose has become more important than it was prior to 2007. And ESG has become more important, environmental, social, and governance. Investors and employees are wanting companies to make a contribution to the broader societal issues and not merely focus on a single metric, which is profit maximization. So that's the one thing um, that has happened. The second thing that has happened is, and this is something I think that is still evolving, the definition of the worker. If you go back to the old model, the, the one that, that I would, you know, my thesis would be that model is largely um, passed. It consisted of permanent workers. You then started seeing, probably in the 80s into the 90s, and non-permanent workers begin to enter the workforce. If you look at where we are today, the worker and what one defines as the worker, your workforce today, and many companies are in that space already, consists of permanent workers, contingent workers, contractors, gig workers, crowdsourcing of human cloud is a big thing right now. And then also the non-human worker, artificial intelligence and robots. So your workforce today consists of all of these various actors. And one of the, the things that we see consistently that has occurred over the last couple of years, we, we remember of SIA, the, the International Staffing Agency, and they do research into this. Uh, the one trend that's come through over the last decade is that companies now expect that the permanent component of their workforce will shrink into the future. And we're talking necessarily blue, uh, white collar not so much um, blue collar. So the, the nature of the workforce has changed. The way that we define where work takes place, and COVID has accelerated that trend. COVID didn't bring that trend about, it was already taking place, where you now have workers who with technology are able to work remotely. And it's now accepted all that COVID has done. It has made this kind of engagement, the one that you are and I are having now, um, acceptable. Whereas maybe before COVID, people would have been more reluctant to take part in, in a board meeting by Zoom. And right now, board meetings take place uh, in Zoom. So the nature of work or the place of work has changed. Work is now no longer associated with a single geographical location that people come to. Work now gets done where people are located. What this will do, and where I think the fundamental challenge lies, 
is that whilst the work, the nature of the workforce has changed, the geography of the workforce has changed, what is lagging is that the managerial approach to that is still largely premised in the old model. And these are some of the aspects that you have highlighted. They are changing. We are seeing companies come to market now, and whether it's Uber or whether it's any of the tech companies, where that model is necessarily changing. And I think that's the challenge that we face, is that I'm not sure that we are teaching our managers to manage this disparate workforce in multiple locations. Managers are still falling back largely, I think, on the traditional approach, which uh, I shared an article on my LinkedIn, um, on my LinkedIn profile around presenteeism, where managers feel more comfortable saying, well, if I can see you, then I can manage you. But of course, mm -hmm. that becomes impossible with a diverse workforce. So I think the examples that you have shared, I think they are still there. They are changing, but they're probably not changing as fast as the workforce is changing. Let's, let's go back a bit, because I always <laughs> love it when, when guests talk <clears throat> about purpose. It sort of gets me super excited, because uh, my personal view is that purposeful organizations outperform on average their profit-driven peers. And by purpose, as you, you described, you know, having something deeper than profit, more, more really focused on societal benefit, right? Not having an add-on of, uh, you know, doing something which is good for sustainability as a kind of like brand, you know, enhancement. Actually having something at the center of your organization where you're trying to solve a genuine problem. And whenever you see these companies, um, they tend to do quite well. Google organizing the world's informa you know, information, Tesla making sustainable transport commonplace, or you could look here and you could go to Discovery, helping people to live longer. And you consistently see them doing incredibly well. My sense is though, and, and sorry, just to add to that, we've also got some fairly senior financiers starting to back this as well. I think, think from BlackRock coming out and saying, yep. they're going to change how they invest. And if you're not putting sustainability and environment at the center of what you do, um, they're gonna give you a hard time. My sense though, is that for most organizations, this is still marketing. It's not genuine in the center of their organization yet. So what's your sense? I, I, I don't think you're wrong, sadly. I don't think you're wrong. So if you look at this, this uh, how purpose has become more important. And again, I think it probably ties into the post 2009 period. It's only been around for about a decade where investors are starting to say we want to understand your purpose. And I think it's, it's partially a consequence of uh, the post-2009 crisis and Generation Y and Generation Z uh, entering. And I think for many companies, they still see this potentially as a bit of, well, it's sort of these airy fairy thing. You know, we, we put it on the wall and as long as we have a purpose, we, we could to go. That will change when there is a correlation between financial performance of the company and the purpose. And a couple of weeks ago, I read an, a, an academic article that had been published either in MIT Review or HBS or whatever, where it was the first academic study that had been done that went to look at companies that had not only a strong purpose, but were authentic in giving effect to that purpose. And that's the key. You know, your purpose can't just be a couple of words on the wall. It has to be lived. And looking at how those companies performed relative to their peers who did not have as strong or as authentic or as in practice a purpose. And the companies of the purpose actually financially significantly outperformed, to your point, those companies that didn't. And I think investors are saying, hang on, this purpose thing is not something airy-fairy. It actually translates into superior performance. And therefore, I think you are going to see, I, I had that question in our results presentation. I think you are going to see investors um, increasingly saying, well, hang on, we want to see um, your purpose. So I, I think you're absolutely spot on. I think companies are battling with authenticity. How do you turn this purpose into actions? And therefore, it's not just about, and I think a lot of companies are still there with, let's, let's get a mission, let's get a vision, let's get a purpose statement, and let's just continue. But I think their workforce, their employees are, are looking at that saying, that's not authentic. Their customers increasingly are saying, that's not authentic. And their investors are increasingly saying, that's not authentic. So I think companies will be under pressure to take their purpose. Firstly, make it clear because a lot of companies' purpose is not clear. And then secondly, stakeholders are saying we want to see that in action. So I think, I think it's a process that, um, that is evolving. But if, you know, if we're starting to see that companies who have strong purposes and authentic purposes outperform those who do not, then I think the pressure will build very, very quickly. Uh, most recently, you see Total changing the name to, to Total Energies. And that's mm -hmm. in response 
to the investor saying, look, you can't just be digging out carbon-based fuels and polluting the world. We want you to be a different company. They've changed. Their purpose is now um, to, to provide energy that's environmentally um, friendly. So I, I do think it will grow, but it's a journey and, and different companies are moving at different speeds. Um, but I think in 10 years time, companies that do not have a purpose are going to be punished by investors. Yeah, I want, I want to segue from purpose now into, you know, what we've seen from COVID and the changes that are coming through. And, and I suppose if I think about purposeful organizations, there's a, there's a question for you coming. They seem to have been able to break away from the industrial hierarchical models easier. And my sense is that because they've got purpose, they found it easier to build trust with their workforce. <clears throat> they found it easier to give autonomy to teams because they're trying to achieve something which is emotionally resonating with their different stakeholders, customers, staff, and um, investors, to name just three. And when COVID therefore has hit and you've suddenly gone from being all together in the office to not being able to see each other, as you were saying, you know, not having that presenteeism, they've been able to have that trust with their colleagues more inherently because they're still trying to achieve some sort of purpose as opposed to you know getting overly worried about activities that they think are going to generate you know short term revenue or cost savings is, is that your sense as well i think so and and i think you you're spot on in your analysis and let's talk around why people join companies and why people leave companies at the end of the day people join companies because they want to feel that they're contributing to something beyond just profit maximization. And this, this comes to this issue of purpose. It's a, you know, it's a very central issue. People want to know that the affinity that they have for a company goes about what the company does and the difference that they make. And therefore, let's bring it back to this concept of the workforce, because it is a structural issue that many companies are going to battle to deal with, but necessarily have to deal with. The concept of the workforce previously was the permanent worker. And therefore, if you were not permanent, you were kind of there, but you were, you were really not you know, part of this workforce. And it's premised, I think, on the principle that the affinity that an employee has for a company is based on whether they are permanent or not. Now, I think that that is a flawed approach. The affinity that, that your various components of the workforce have for the company must necessarily be based on whether people feel that they genuinely believe in what this company is doing. If you make that the center of, of your, your, your organization, then it actually doesn't matter whether the person is permanent, whether they are a contractor, whether they're a gig worker, whether they're a contingent worker. It actually doesn't matter whether they are working in the office, whether they're working from home, whether there's some other working arrangement, because the affinity, what brings people together is not the fact that I happen to be a permanent employee. And I think there are companies battling to make that transition. So knowing that I'm there not just to feed my family, but I'm there in, in my case, because the most beautiful thing you can ever say to someone, I think, is, you know, as an example, Colin, I've got good news for you, the job that you've applied for, um, they want to make you an offer. That, that's such a wonderful feeling. That's such a wonderful conversation to have. And, and that's where the joy comes from. And that's what brings teams together. Once you've got that, it's then easier for managers to trust for managers to manage on an output basis. But if in your development as a manager, you've only been trained in the traditional command and control um, framework, it's unsettling. And it also reflects that a lot of managers, and, and maybe this is, this is a harsh view to take, that a lot of managers don't have that skill. They actually don't know how to lead. They don't know how to inspire and motivate. They don't know how to get their employees to trust them. So consequently, they resort to 1950s era management style. You need to be here by eight and you leave at five. If I don't see you by your desk, you're not working. And the companies that stick with that, I think are increasingly going to be left behind by the market. So along comes COVID-19 and um, obviously we can't stress just the, the disastrous implications it's had for health and for finances globally. It's I've never seen anything like it in my lifetime. But if there is one silver light that we can look at, surely it is the fact that we're having to experiment with workers working from home and learn what this system might be like, because it feels like it's the sort of thing which can 
um, accelerate breaking down some of those more pervasive and traditional models that we started this conversation with. Yeah, and, and, and you're spot on. I think that's that's absolutely correct. But it brings with it a whole range of other factors that companies need to think about very carefully. And let's just take 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 us back to when the pandemic broke. Not just in South Africa, not just in Australia where we operate, but globally. Companies went from being five days a week in the office to literally having to go fully work from home within days. And companies successfully pulled that off. The fear prior to COVID, and we had started to see the emergence of the sort of remote working, if you like. Mm -hmm. But companies were always afraid, how do I measure productivity? How do I make sure that people are actually working? Uh, you know, there was this fear that if we allow people to work remotely and we don't monitor them command and control style, that they actually, they won't be productive. So when COVID eating companies were forced by and large to go into this remote and work from home situation, there was initial expectation that maybe productivity would go down. Pro productivity actually spiked. And sort of a year ago, you had companies saying, wow, we've seen this enormous spike in productivity. Maybe we actually, you know, what was the purpose of the office? Maybe we, we won't ever go to offices. And, and in my previous organization, which was a workplace organization, we, we saw clients saying, well, post the pandemic, we don't expect more than half of our employees to return to the office. You know, we don't have as much offices and so forth. And that was fine for a period of time. But then in the second half of the pandemic, the last six months, you started to see the consequences associated with extended work from home. And, and I've said on many occasions that the mental health issues associated with work from home is the next, pan, the, the next wave that is going to hit. And analogously, let me take you back to, to one of my previous lives where I worked in retail. And, you know, I'm betraying my age here, but I worked for a large retailer in South Africa in the time when shops weren't open on a Sunday. And the retailer was contemplating opening their stores on a Sunday. And there, was two, there were two schools of thought. The one school of thought was, well, if you open on a Sunday, people who previously used to shop on a Friday or a Saturday would come to shop on a Sunday. So you'd get exactly the same turnover, but you'd have additional cost because you're now open on a Sunday. And the other school of thought was, well, actually people shop because the shops are open. And we, we know where we are today, that it's the latter approach that is, in fact, the correct approach. And that's because shopping is not merely a utility function, but it is a social function as well. And if you bring that back to the workplace, the office is not merely a place that you work. It's actually a social function as well. And I think companies are now realizing that the office serves a social purpose and not just a desk purpose where I do my work. And the consequences of hybrid working or working from home for extended periods is the loss of the connection that people have to their teams, to their line managers, to the broader organization, and the mental health issues for some people associated um, with that. So I do think you've seen over the last couple of months, companies now saying, actually, we, we do think we're going to be back to a, a four or five day work week. We, we actually think we are going to be back to 75, 80% occupancy. And that may be a swing too far the other way. But I think what COVID has taught us is that the place of work is not merely where you do the work, but it's a, it's a, a crucial component of the social aspect of work. It's where I meet my colleagues, it's where I build teams. And if you think about how high-performing teams get built, they're not in meetings like this. They're not in structured meetings. It's the five minutes before the meeting starts during the coffee break, the time after the meeting. You build a team when your colleague sits in close proximity to you and you say, listen, I'm going down to grab a sandwich in the canteen. Do you want to come with? That's where that cohesiveness in a team gets built. When you work from home, that's a lot harder to do. So I do think what you will see is whilst COVID has shown that it's possible to have remote working without a negative impact on productivity, Whilst COVID has allowed us to be accepting of this kind of engagement where it's completely virtual, uh, it, it's interesting. I became CEO of AdCorp and I never met a single board member physically. Everything was done electronically and that's now acceptable. But I think companies are also, for the first time, maybe thinking about, hang on, there's, there's a non-work-related aspect that we also need to deal with, the mental health issues. 
building teams, the social engagement. And I therefore expect that the workplace will increasingly migrate to a place that facilitates the social engagement between teams. And, and I do, you know, some of the layouts that you are seeing in the workplaces now, I do think we are moving away from the cubicle farm, which if you've ever seen a Dilbert cartoon, you, you will know yeah. these swathes of cubicles um, to more a place where people can connect with their peers, can connect with their teammates, even if it's for one or two days a week. I do think the, the future is more of a hybrid um, situation. I want to go to some questions, but before I do that, I want to go back to where you uh, started on that piece, because um, companies were worried about, you know, trust and productivity and measuring productivity, and then they had no choice. COVID happened, everyone has to work remotely. And, and of course, it was going to be fine. Uh, the technology's there. People know what they're doing usually for the next couple of weeks, right? Now you're four or five months in. To me, that's where the, the holes and the breaks start to occur because you now don't know quite what the plan is or you haven't had the interaction or you've employed some new people who don't quickly network with the rest of the organisation to understand where they stand. How are you seeing companies deal with deal with that? Are they still trying to find ways to go and test productivity or is trust there and they're flying blind and actually everything seems to be working okay and maybe they don't need to... To, uh, to go and measure specific aspects and, and things will work out all right. Where, where are you seeing this both actually at AdCorp and how you're working with your team and, and where your clients are sitting? And then I'm going to go on and promise I'm going to try to get through. There's quite a few actually. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> I'll get them in a sec. No, no worries, Colin. It's, uh, there's not a single um, response that we are seeing. It depends on the company. It depends on the sector. It depends on the maturity. It depends on the leadership. And the responses are quite... Um, quite different. There's a group of companies that I think are going, ooh, let's get back to the way it was. Let's bring everyone in for five days a week. And, and that's companies that are still in, in the space of presenteeism. And those are companies who are, instead of trying to deal with the issue of how do we train our managers, how do we skill our leaders to manage in this environment, are saying, well, let's just bring everyone back and, and we can go back to the way we used to operate. Then we are seeing companies that are saying, hang on, we, and, and this is where we as AdCorp are trying to go. At this point in time, we have all of our employees on work from home uh, in South Africa, not so in Australia, because the situation is uh, slightly different. Prior to that, we had hybrid working. I think we are seeing, there are some companies that are saying, well, look, let us find a place where we get the benefits of work from home. And if you put yourself in the shoes of the work, the benefits are substantial. I don't have to sit in traffic for two hours a day. You know, I can actually take my kid to school. I can work my diary around being able to do some of the things that I was not able to do when I was chained to my desk in the office. Let's get that benefit, but let's also try and deal with some of these the social and relationship issues I spoke about earlier and have this hybrid work from home situation where we ask our teams to come in two or three days a week and the rest of the time we allow employees to work from home. I think that sort of balance seems to meet uh, the needs of both the employees and the uh, employer. There's not many companies, I believe, that can fully embrace work from home in perpetuity, precisely because of the challenges I spoke about earlier. It's, it's really difficult to build teams. It's also really difficult to build creativity because five people in the room talking about an object or, or, or about a problem, they, they feed off each other. When you do that in a Zoom context or a Teams context, it, it simply isn't there because you can't see the other five people. It's not as spontaneous. It's not as collaborative. And when you're working together as a team and you take a break and everyone's having you know, a cup of coffee and a muffin or whatever, that kind of offline chatting often um, sparks people's thoughts so that when they get back in, they, there's more energy. So I think this hybrid work from home is, is probably the space that, that AdCorp would like to go into. And we see companies choosing that path. But I do worry that the one gap that companies have not addressed is how do we train our managers to manage in this environment? And, and that's a challenge that I think a lot of companies are battling with. Um, and, and there's an opportunity for, for companies to think very carefully how they incentivize, how they train managers, what behaviors they reward, what behaviors they sanction, so that they do create an environment where everyone who is a worker feels part of the team and not merely the permanent staff who happen to be in the office 
on the day that the boss is there. All right, so um, questions here. Andrew Mason, good one here to uh, kick off organizational culture. Sorry, culture. Is it under threat because of this work from home model? Sorry, won't you do me a favor? And, and hello, Andrew. Um, uh, Colin, won't you repeat that question for me because I think I lost you. Organizational culture, is it under threat from this hybrid remote working model? And is it amplifying any lack of cohesion and collaboration within the workplace? It, it's, a, it's an interesting question because it goes to the definition of what constitutes culture. And a simplistic way to look at culture is, is the way things are done in an organization. What is accepted, what is not accepted. And the culture is largely set by the leadership, starting from the office of the CEO. If you've got progressive leaders, if you've got leaders that believe in the purpose, if you've got leaders that are caring, I think they will find a way to ensure not only that in this hybrid or remote working or, or this very complex workforce of the future, that the purpose, the culture will, will flow through. So I don't think necessarily that it needs to affect culture. But what it does do, and I think rightly so, it places demands on senior leadership to actually lead. And I think there are too many organizations that are overmanaged and underled. And I think people who can't lead, people who are, who are good at clock watching and, and are wedded to presenteeism, I think they will battle because that, those practices don't build culture. So I don't think culture necessarily needs to be affected, but what it does do, it places a greater emphasis on the senior leadership in an organization to lead and not merely to manage. Uh, hopefully, and, uh, you know, Andrew, that gives you uh, uh, a, a bit of an answer. Nice one here from Corning, which is on a similar theme as well. Um, I think you touched on it a bit earlier as well. So I'm, I'm wondering if I'm predicting correctly where you're gonna go on the answer, but how do you make employees in a work from home remote hybrid culture still feel part of this uh, community? It's, it's such a good question, Corne, and, and, and thank you for that question. I, I will, I've always taken a view, whether it's with AdCorp or any other company, that you never have to go and ask what the values of a company are. It should be values in action, not values that are espoused. So let us take the example of a call it the workforce of the future, where you've got permanent staff, contingent staff, contractors, gig, et cetera. If you as a management team only regard your permanent workers as part of the workforce, so when you have a team meeting, you only invite them. Um, when, when there are things to be communicated, you only communicate to them. You immediately create a situation where those who are not permanent are seeing themselves or experience that they're, in a sense, second-class workers. So it goes about treating people consistently, fairly, um, across whatever kind of worker they are. And that approach translates, I think, to the workplace as well. So as long as I, as an employee, believe that whether I am working from home or working in the office or working from a, a regis type office, um, that I'm going to be treated fairly, that my manager is not going to discriminate against me, you know, then I'm going to be fine. So it's incumbent for companies to ensure, in my view, that from a management perspective, you treat people fairly because in my experience over 20 years in, in business, that's what people want. People want to be treated fairly. They want to know that they've got an equal opportunity. Yes, we're not all going to get to the very top of the organization, but that's simply because it's a numbers game. There's only one CEO with 40,000 employees. But if the employees feel that they actually do get an equal opportunity, that they do get an equal shake, then I think you will be fine. So it's incumbent that, in my opinion, whether you're working from home, whether you're working in the office, whether you're working in a regis type office, whether you are a permanent employee, a contractor, a contingent worker, that companies treat people consistently, fairly, evenly, then I think you, you have far, far less issues. I always thought people didn't want to become CEO because it's the it's a crazy job. Who wants to do it? Still defined, huge amounts of pressure, <laughs> and you get all the blame. And uh, and every time it goes well, you have to say well done to everyone that worked for you. So it's never, <laughs> never something that appealed to me. Mike Wood asks a more intelligent question here. Uh, do you think the success of work from home is largely as a result of pre-existing relationships that were created 
in a uh, work work for work environment. I, I think it's a brilliant you know question because imagine the company has just started and it was work from home native, like we say cloud native. You know, it's work from home native. You know, so they've never met each other. They've just built remotely from the ground up, and they've now got thousands of employees. You know, could that work? Because clearly, as we said, you know, when you start working from home and you've worked together for years and decades, it's a lot easier to make that transition in the short term. That's a very good question. And I think the, the response is, is probably going to be industry specific. And, and I'll give you a real life example. One of the other things that I do is, is, is I chair a software company. That, that company does work in the um, financial services industry. They build software for clearing houses. And the company is based in Johannesburg. Its developers in their large number of them are based in, in a single office. And what happened with COVID was uh, everyone then worked remotely and the company didn't see a drop off in productivity. And the CEO said to me a couple of weeks ago, I'm actually going to go down to Cape Town and I'm going to go down to Cape Town because I think I can get developers there cheaper than I can get them in Johannesburg and more readily available. So I'm going to employ them there. And I'm not going to ask them to relocate to Johannesburg. And as long as they're willing to come up every now and then uh, for a couple of days, I'm very comfortable that they can work um, from home. So for me, that the whole nature of how you approach that has, um, you know, that has, has, necessarily, has necessarily changed. And I think going back to the question, if you take the approach that you want this to work, you can make it work. Yes, you have an advantage if there's pre-existing relationships in place because it's easier. Yes, it's a challenge if you've got a new person joining and they're joining virtually because a lot of the bonding is when the new person comes in and we've all been there at, at some stage in our careers. You come in, you the newbie, you, you don't know how things get done. So you ask people. And the best way to do it is you get up from your desk and you go to your colleague and say, listen, um, if I need to get the, where do I get the printing done? Who can I ask? And the person says, oh, you know, ask, ask Sally or ask Joe over there. Um, they'll, or the person says, come, I'll show you where the printer is. You lose that if it's a pure remote um, or work from home situation. And therefore the team is less efficient. The person is actually less efficient. So I think it is going to be advantageous. I don't think it's impossible to bring new people in. One of the challenges that we have seen is the difficulty in onboarding new people during COVID. And whilst everyone went to work from home when the pandemic broke, after six or seven months, I think you started to see as staff changed, new people coming in, they were not as effective because whilst you have the formal network in an organization, it's actually the informal network. You know who to turn to to get things done. So you know, if I've got a problem with my computer, um, you know, Joe down the down the aisle, he can help me. But when you're at home, it now becomes a lot more difficult, especially if you're a new person. Who do I phone? Who do I email? How do I get hold of, hold of them? So I do think it's more difficult. I don't think it's impossible. Um, and therefore, I let's think this hybrid let's situation... That one, John. Let's, let's challenge this one because, um, you know, I'll put it from my perspective. I'm, I'm getting a bit older in the tooth now, all right? And I'd love if there's anyone on the call here to, to comment back on this, especially if they're under 30, under 35. Right, because there, there's two challenges. That one is when you go and, and say we can collaborate if we're together, and that happens. If you go and look at a typical hierarchy, literally in a in a block of you know flats or a high-rise building or a big open, you only actually collaborate with the people in your proximity. You never go to the floor above and just randomly meet people yeah. and come up with these awesome sorts of ideas. So you do get collaboration here, but you miss out on all of the other people in the organisation. I get the sense that working from home and technology is now just exploded that because we can talk to anyone anywhere. We're used to it. We don't feel daft doing it. Um, whereas before we felt a lot more comfortable talking to people in our proximity. And then the second thing, I, I probably don't want to take it too far, but I look at my children, you know, my 13, 14 year old, they're getting plenty of relationships which they're building, right? Whether it's through um, the Fortnite games that they're playing or more importantly, the platforms they're communicating with like Discord, Discord online all the time, video or chat, just join. It's almost like popping your head around the corner. So I'm, I'm curious if this is a bit of a generation thing where the youngsters are going to find it a lot easier and enjoy it a lot more and be able to build relationships in a way which would feel a bit foreign to the likes of you and I. Yeah, there are two answers. 
probably a couple of answers to that. The short answer is yes, you will probably find that generation Y, generation Z, and alpha generation, that's that's the youngsters today. I mean, you, you and I have seen it. Uh, three or four friends sitting together, young, young um, children, you know, my daughter's 10 now, uh, sitting next to each other and talking to each other via the phone. So they're WhatsApping each other, but they're sitting next to each other. So that's a fundamentally different way. The likes of you and I didn't have cell phones when we were young, so we were forced to socially engage. So I do think it's going to be easier for them. The difference, though, is that is in a fun social context. That's a, a context that isn't structured. I think if you put three kids together that had never met each other and, that, and you put them in a formally structured meeting, um, it's going to be awkward initially. So where you've got a social environment where there's fun and, and it's something that I willingly partake in, absolutely. The work situation is slightly different. And where it becomes a challenge, if you think about your time in, in banking, you often meet people for the first time outside of a formal context. You would, someone would see you and, and you, you talk to them. So my time as a banker, the meetings were very structured. They, they were very sort of organized. People spoke when they needed to speak. You know, when you were a youngster, you sat in those meetings and you attended so that you learned. But it was when you had those spontaneous one-on-ones where you asked the colleague, listen, how do I do this? And the colleague said, listen, go chat to that person over there. They can help you. And you went in and introduced yourself. You, you introduced yourself. Hi, Joe has sent me because he thinks you can assist me. And the person said, yeah, let, let, let me sit down with you. I don't think it's as easy to do that virtually because in the work environment, the meetings are very, very structured. They have agendas, they have fixed times. They're not as spontaneous. They're not fun things for certain. They occasionally are. So I, I, I hear your point. I think it will be easier for the younger generation to do that. But a lot of our working relations are not built in formalized meetings. They're built in informal meetings. They're built in people seeing each other and chatting for five minutes and they built through referrals. And it's very hard to do referrals via a, um, a webcam. I want to bring a question here, which is a great question, by the way, from uh, Maud. And um, based on, I don't, know which, I don't know which example it was, do you think you're going to see salary, uh, salary disparities between provinces? But before um, I dig into that a bit more, I want to ask a lead-in question. Do you expect the gig economy to start to explode now? Because one reason we have offices and companies is because you have to have people in proximity to each other to get anything done. Now, in theory, we can be anywhere in the world for many industries and many roles. You can have the work for part from time zone issues anywhere you want it to be. So that the first part of the question is, do you think we're therefore going to see an explosion of this kind of gig economy where there's a lot more contracting, there's a lot more short term engagements with different staff because of skill sets they're in, they do something, they're gone, you know, or, or they're being outsourced to in a much more fluid type way? I think the, the, the answer is yes, and it's not just a, a perspective. Uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, you know, the SIA does, does regular surveys every year on what employees are expecting. And the one consistent theme over the last five years is that employee, employers expect that their permanent workforce as a percentage of the total workforce will reduce. At the same time, they are expecting that their contractor, their contingent, their gig component will increase. So I think that's a trend that um, that will happen. Uh, you know, the, the word explosive may be maybe a bit of an overstatement because whilst the component of those non-permanent workers will grow, they won't displace permanent workers. So I think the percentage of gig workers will grow. There, there are problems associated with gig workers as well, and, and there's been some element of backlash where. Uh, you know, employees feel that companies can potentially exploit gig workers. So, you know, the zero hour contract, which, which manifests itself in the UK is, is hugely um, problematic because you're contracting someone, but you're not promising them anything. So I think as long as you make sure as a company that in bringing onboard contractors, bringing onboard gig workers, you treat them fairly, you make them part of your team, you remunerate them um, appropriately, then I think gig workers will feel comfortable. And I think that the definition of gig worker, uh, more, you, pr you probably meant it in the broadest sense. I mean, there's so many different components of it. So what I think you will see in the future is this, this dynamic workforce where companies are 
potentially needing specific skills for a period of time. They can't afford to employ the skilled person permanently because A, it's, it's not affordable and B, they don't need the person beyond a specific um, period of time. That kind of demand, I think, will increasingly be met by, let's call it a broad contingent approach, whether it's contractor or gig or third-party provider or, or mechanical Turk or human cloud. I think it will play a, a bigger part of the workforce makeup of the future. Okay, so we're, we're going to see an expansion in this. And obviously, some of the problems that you've mentioned, we will now we have problems because of this new environment, there will be solutions. Let's deal who are sponsoring this. I've got some awesome solutions there to go and help that gig economy to contract anywhere in the world to understand jurisdictions without actually being there. So we're going to go and see this. Now we'll go back to that question from um, Maud. What's that going to do for salaries? And your example there is I'm sitting here happily in Joburg or New York, earning a uh, elevated salary because of the cost of living. Then, because we can now work from anywhere, I decide to go to the Eastern Cape or from New York down into the, the countryside somewhere, you know, into the, uh, into the middle of America. And suddenly I've got a totally different wealth standard because everything's so much cheaper. What are, what are we going to expect companies to do there? Because historically they've paid us based on where we are located. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, an important question. And we still seeing the answer evolve. And I think you're going to wind up with a situation where the economics will ultimately determine what salaries are being paid. And it's the old supply and demand. If you have, if let's firstly start with the perspective of a company saying, I'm happy to employ remote workers. I'm less concerned about where they are, which then means you may have a worker that is located in Switzerland and a worker that's located in uh, Zimbabwe able to do exactly the same um, output. The work in Zimbabwe may well be willing to bid that work at a lower price. And therefore the work in Switzerland is going to be under pressure um, based on their cost. So I do think that the economics will come into play, that as the availability of resources is now no longer defined by geography, it will result in lower cost um, parts of the world being able to compete more effectively. And that will then necessarily, probably in some sectors, have a, a depressing effect on, on salaries. So I think economics does come into play. And, and I do think that where companies are saying, we will get remote works from anywhere in the world, necessarily the economics will drive the fact that if they can get them cheaper somewhere, then it's likely that they will employ them from that location then from a more expensive location. What, what's gonna happen next year in terms of the, um... Uh, the best companies and, and recruiting talent. So variation of Jackie uh, Landers question here, because do you think you're going to see companies that people just want to work for because they're, well, and it could go either way, either because A, we want you to come to the office or is it because we want you to work from home, work from anywhere? What, what are going to be the new uh, challenges for HR to go and create working environments where they can attract the best talent when COVID is gone? Now we've just got choice as to how you want to run your companies. If you, if you look at our business in Australia as an example, we are battling to find candidates for the demand that we are seeing. And, and you know, I, wish, I wish it was that way in South Africa where we've got, we've got shockingly high levels of unemployment. And therefore, it is easier for the candidate to say, beyond the financial aspect of what I'm going to be paid, what are the other things? And we see that increasingly where companies in, you know, people have been speaking about the war for talent for, for as, as long as anyone can remember. Uh, the war for talent is a real war for talent. And companies are therefore having to look at how can they create an environment that ensures that the person chooses this company above another company. And that's not for everyone. There's highly specialized skills, they're expensive skills, they're rare skills, and companies are desperate to get those skills. Um, data scientist is, is, is a good example. They, they, you know, you're hard, it, it's hard to find them. And therefore, you know, companies are going to have to look at how do we make it easy for people to work in that space? Flexibility, choice, um, the freedom to work from, from wherever. I think those things make it easier for a candidate to go, actually, you know what, I'll go and work for that company. And those companies tend to be the new wave companies, whether it's Google, whether it's Apple, whether it's you know, the companies that are trying to create workplaces that are inviting, work experiences that are flexible, work cultures that are purpose-driven, 
those are the kind of companies that I think Generation Y and Generation Z young, young people are, are saying, that's the company I want to work for. Uh, so I think companies are going to be looking at that aspect. Um, and the war for talent is a real war for talent. But for large swathes of um, the workforce, where the skill is readily available, the companies are probably going to be less pressurized to do that. John, that's awesome. Lawrence, welcome back. Jeez. Uh, I mean, there's no doubt we started the session with thinking that we're going to get some insights from John. And I'll tell you something, I've been taking copious notes here. Uh, you know, the, 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 the pushback, or not the pushback, the question from my side, or at least the thought process from my side is around that concept of leadership. And I think that's, that is at the core of the challenge that we have. You know, you can have uh, technology disruption, you can have workplace disruption, um, leadership is central to that in respect of understanding those challenges, how to manage those challenges. And most importantly, I think another key message is how do you incorporate these individuals and make sure that they're part of a culture of organization to ensure productivity. So I also think another comment from my side, which is interesting, I was doing some research and some reading the uh, night before last. I mean, the extent of growth in uh, technology enablement companies internationally over the last two years has been explosive. And it's all really come about and, uh, you know, as a result of the crisis of COVID. So organizations and people have been forced into a position of making change. And that, and that change has disintermediated certain businesses and industries and created new. And I think the, the, the bottom line from my side is, is change is good. You know, with, with change comes growth, comes development, comes a need to introspect as companies and leadership to understand how we do things differently. And I think it's our ability to be able to embrace that that will determine how successful we are from a company point of view, from a country point of view, from an economy point of view, and then from a global point of view. But John, I mean, like I said, I think your, your input is, is absolutely amazing. And uh, no doubt, I think the, the level of audience uh, participation today and the number of people that have actually come on to the webinar is testimony to, uh, uh, to your contribution. So really, thank you so much for that. I just want to state um, uh, it's a great opportunity for me to announce that, like we said, this is part of a deal series that we're going to be rolling out. I think a critical question that we need to look at in the next session, which will hopefully be hosted in the next two or three weeks' time, all of you will receive information, is this impact of technology and more specifically the platforms that are having on the mobility of global talent pools. Um, we've invited uh, Alex Baziz, who's the founder and the chief executive officer of Deal, to share his story with us, going from startup to unicorn status in a matter of 18 months, two years building out of a platform that transcends geographic boundaries and offers opportunity for talent pools globally to engage in contract with global employers in, in a frictionless environment. So I think the role of technology in all of these challenges that we have is absolutely critical. I think uh, the fact that boundaries and geography is no, longer, is no longer a boundary to employment opportunity also represents substantial benefits and opportunity for South African job seekers. You don't necessarily need to work for a South African company. If you have the skills, you can stay in South Africa and work for a company in New York. Huge opportunity, huge challenges, but definitely something to look at. Just from my side, a parting comment, a uh, little bit of light. We're dealing with chaos in 1944 towards the end of the Second World War, uh, worldwide destruction. Sir Winston Churchill stood up and said, never let a good crisis go to waste. So on that note, I personally thank John so much for your time and your energy. Thank you. Colin as well, thank you for your time and for, and for, and for driving this discussion. And I'll hand back to you, Colin. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much, John. And thanks, Lawrence, for setting up these sessions. To everyone on the call, thank you very much for joining. Please do leave your views about what you liked, what you didn't like, what topics you want to be covered in future sessions. I'm going to keep the call open just for another 60 seconds or so when we sign off and play that uh, intro music again. At least you can bop along to that, I mean, even if you don't type anything. <laughs> um, really, really great. And then the other thing is please uh, do follow, um, whether it's on my page, it's probably the easiest one at the moment, so we get a landing page together for you so that you find out when the next events that are coming up. I'm really looking forward to the deal one. It's not often you get to talk to someone to learn how they've grown a business from zero to a valuation of 1.5 billion 
or more in the space of 18 months. That is going to be absolutely fascinating. So with that, have a lovely afternoon. I hope you stay safe and your family and friends stay safe too. And we'll see you again in a week or two.